Hi, my name is Clinton Erling, and I'm the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The Chamber's Business Review is an informative weekly television magazine of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We will showcase the activities of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, feature interviews of prominent business personalities, and broadcast our popular training seminars for the entire country's benefit. So please sit back and enjoy while we indulge your attention over the next half an hour. The Ghana Fire Service is once again pleased to be associated with the hosting and holding of this important activity. As I look today, I could see definitely that there is an improvement every year since we have held this thing four years ago. It shows clearly that the business community, which holds a large stake in the risk of the city, is also keen on being a part of the whole process of ensuring that our environment is more safe and primarily safe from fire. Ladies and gentlemen, I speak to you today as the Chief Fire Officer of the Guyana Fire Service and I will try to be as frank as possible in outlining our feelings and our impressions as to the relationships between the Guyana Fire Service and the private sector, more importantly the commercial or business community. I feel that there is indeed very cordial and improved relationships with the private sector based on a lot of feedbacks that we get on a daily basis. Indeed that there are some agencies within the private sector that the fire service has a very close working relationship with, those of the manufacturing concerns, the uh, storage of products, product, mostly the petroleum-based organizations, the manufacturing concerns, and of course the insurance agencies. That does not say that the fire service doesn't have larger reaches to the other smaller commercial groups within the city of Georgetown and Guyana at large. However, we have also noted, as the speakers would have said, said before, this phenomenal increase and improvement in the commercial sector, especially the space occupied by the commercial sector in Georgetown especially. We have seen this transformation taking the shape of larger buildings, different types of uh, buildings, and also different types of storages being dotting the landscape of Georgetown. Of course, we've also had incidents of fires within some of these same structures. And it brings to fore the need, more importantly, for more prudent fire safety measures being implemented and being enforced by force the occupiers and owners of these facilities. Because we strongly believe, and it is the right belief of all, that this has to be done first and foremost by the persons who occupy and use these buildings. When you look around the city of Georgetown, the first impression you get of the safety of these, these um, business enterprises is the safety or the security safety part of it, being, being that the buildings are very secure from unwanted entry, theft, and so on. But when you look and you go inside, there's very little. If you look at the balance between security safety and fire safety, there's a large gap, and that gap needs to be filled. Two of the recent developments, or two of the recent fires that we would have attended in this year, highlighted that greatly. First, the storage bond on the East Coast. It's time that, as we've been recommended over and over, large storage capacities go to higher levels of fire protection in terms of early warning systems, in terms of venting and air conditioning, and in terms of fire suppression and automatic fire suppression systems. If we go, or some of these same companies operate in other environments or in other jurisdictions, they will implement sprinklers, they will implement venting systems, they will implement uh, dry rising mains, they will implement proper oily warning fire detection systems. I see no reason why this should not be implemented in Guyana too. And these recommendations are being made time and time again ad nauseum by this fire department. Therefore means that more responsibility has to be shown by the owners operators for the protection of their own premises. I'm heartened, however, 
to hear the comments made by the, the representative from Andenan that in their, in their whole assessment of fire risk before they even underwrite the fire coverage of some of these buildings, they also have some treatment policies. I do hope that we could maybe have some kind of connectivity with the company so as to have some clear guidelines and, and a proper, proper system that we're on the, on the same page as it, as it comes to fire safety in some of these buildings. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue of fire safety or this whole, whole fire safety outline ought not to be the only responsibility of the fire service, but it must be a collaborative eff effort because the fire service has two roles indeed. Response to fires and put, to, put on, to put them out after they would have occurred and also to look at what is there pre or prior to the fire. That, the latter, however, needs the collaboration of all and sometimes the cooperation too. Because I know for a fact that I have seen and we have issued in any year close to 40,000 to 50,000 different recommendations for different agencies for them to be implemented. And when you do the re-inspections, most of the times the will to implement these recommendations are sadly lacking. It therefore means that more has to be done to ensure compliance by builders, owners, occupiers of these premises. The, Mr. Orling, and, uh, the chairman of the Fire Advisory Board, spoke ad nauseum about the need for codes. Indeed, there is a process now to have a uniform building code for Guyana being implemented. It's at the draft stage, as, is, as was correctly stated, the fire service would have had a lot of input into this, these codes. Fire service is more importantly enthusiastic in having that section of the code that deals with fire safety, use and occupancy implemented in a speedy manner. And the fire service is also looking forward to having some measure of enforcement of that, of that part of the code. Ladies and gentlemen, fire safety stands on three basic pillars. And those pillars are education, engineering, and enforcement. Today, we are, what we are attempting here is that education part of it, where knowledge is passed on, and persons are aware of what are the basic requirements for operating various types of businesses, properties, and buildings. This is the continuity of more than seven other programs that we have held over the year. We have had programs for the tourism and hospitality sector. We would have had programs for the, some of the uh, high-risk operators, especially the petroleum-based organizations, and also the security services, private security services, that is. And the fire service look forward to these partnerships because we believe that in these forums, more of our understanding of our knowledge and um, what needs to be done is passed on. Indeed, I'm heartened by the sentiments expressed by the previous speakers before me, which clearly il illustrates to us that yes, there is need for a fire service. Two, that the fire service has been doing work. And three, that the fire service needs to build on its capacity. We also understand that, and we have been doing that. If you look at the fire service maybe 10 to 15 years ago, as where it is now, you would see a marked difference in improvement of one, its equipment, its, uh, its expansion program, and its rollout of services. That is a continuing process. Even this year, earlier, I had the distinct pleasure of visiting the Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service in the UK and the Severn Fire College in the UK. And we have been able, through that visit, that invitation, to cement some relationships, establishing a quarter relationship with these, these two agencies, whereby as from next year, members of this Guyana Fire Service will be traveling to the UK to undergo specific, specialized training, as well as instructors from those two agencies will be visiting Guyana to conduct training in country that is suitable to the Guyana context. Now, what we find most times when there are fires, because people are not trained, as to what to do, they panic. Most fires, if not all, most fires are 
discover in its initial state. But because of people panicking and not knowing what to do, the fire escalates. Given the fact that it takes fire less than five seconds to spread twice its size. So within a space of five minutes, an entire building can be engulfed. Okay? So it therefore means whatever we're doing, especially when it comes to firefighting, we need to be very efficient. We need to be very fast. We have to tackle fire in its initial state. Not when it's out of control. Because when it's out of control, only then you can call on the professionals and you can count. Fire service have lots of professionals. Once you call us, we'll be here on time and we'll put out the fire. I can assure you guys that. But the work brigade responsibility is more so as of a marshal. Alright? Their responsibility is to ensure that all staff are trained with requisite knowledge as to what to do in the event of a fire. The marshals are work brigade. They are trained as to how to operate the necessary fire equipment that are provided for whatever institutions or campus. All right, because it will vary. And as we go down, we see how it varies in terms of commercial, in which most of you guys are from commercial, uh, as you think. All right? Your fire equipment would be totally different from that of the prison service or campuses and so forth. Because you guys would more or less uh, depend on the fire extinguishers and you have sprinkler systems and so forth. Some of you guys might have sprinkler systems if not all. Okay? Types of work brigade. Now, like I said earlier, those in commercial premises, example, banks, stores, and so forth, these have what we call fire marshals. They are responsible, like I said, to ensure that all staff are aware of what to do in event of emergency. They also are aware of where to locate the necessary fire equipment. The marshals are also um, should ensure that the staff are trained and allowed to operate these fire extinguishers or fire fighting equipment and so forth. So we have the commercial premises work again in terms of marshals and so forth. Then we also have those in industrial premises, factories for example. So wherever there, wherever there is openings, cracks, stairway, elevator shaft, creases, wherever it is, it's gonna find that way and keep going. You always want to go. But a fire like that, whatever um, materials in that building they cannot withstand material gas that is moving around the building, they did not fire. Some of the recommendations you will see when the fire service sent to your plan, one of them is that you will see this building, the walls which separate the room and the various departments must extend from ground to ceiling level. From ground to ceiling level. That is still, that is so slow down fire spread. As in a hotel, if you tell hotels, well, the wall must extend from the ground to ceiling level. Now let's say in your home, right, where you have your kitchen, living room, bedrooms, sitting room. And let's say the fire starts in the kitchen. And the wall is not extended ground to ceiling level. As the hot air and gas rises in the kitchen area, rises on the shoe. Because the walls at the ceiling level, there is no way to block it. Like it travels upward and it travels around the building at, at a ceiling level. More intense it gets, more it will travel. So it travels ceiling, and as I said before, as I said, it gets more intense if we start to drop low. Okay? Particularly when it did. Wow. So as it travels around the building, fire starting the kitchen area, travels, living room, um, it will go to the sitting room. What you have in your sitting room, the table, chairs, refrigerator, fridge, um, microwave, probably the heat is not intense enough to ignite those. Travel around, 
side of your walls where you have the blinds. Start to ignite the blinds because the blinds are combustible material. Right? Travel in your bedroom, what you have in your bedroom. On your bed, you have sponge, pillowcase. Then you go into your, some of you may have um, clothes in the bedroom somewhere. Some of the females will have some nice clothing somewhere and not some nice negligee, nice gum and thing. Those are very, as a low initial temperature, it will ignite those. And that is how, so as it spread, as it rises, the degrees go up, the degrees go up, and eventually start to consume these things in the building. There is a time though, it will come a time in the building when you will have what we call uniform temperature. Meaning, let's say majority of the materials in your room has an initial temperature of 90 degrees. Majority of them. You will have materials in, in your building that will have over 90 degrees. Okay, you may have a couple of fire resistant materials in your building, but majority of your material, your chairs set in your living room and all in your chairs, thing, things in your bedrooms and so forth. And the temperature reaches in the 90s into the hundreds, it will have what we call uniform. Um, fire spread and there is something known as flashover that will take place in the building so people tell you man I see this fire in the kitchen fire start 2 o'clock and by the time you do this and do that and do that and do this and run some run and come here go for some bucket of water come back this entire building that is how fire appears that is how that is what we call convection and that is the main reason why your fuel must be stored, when I say fuel now actually, but you have seen the victory in them. Must be stored outdoors. That is why the cooking gas has to be stored outdoors. I'm not sure about the one I use to cook it. But those people who sell gas, propane gas, you have to store them outdoors. So when you pass a building and you see them in a cage out there, it's not a style design or advertisement. That's a requirement. Right? That's a requirement. And you have to use a, a cage because that is for the cooking gas, that is the type of enclosure, storage, that is the type of van. Because you can't put the gas in a, in a van that is walled up or bowled up. But you can't use no thing but tar. Right? So you have to use a steel cage that is well ventilated. So you have air going into this gas bottle all the time. So that the temperature can be very low. Right? Keep, keep the uh, initial temperature down. Right? Those with convection. So the fuel is stored outdoors because if any of if any of the fuel escape, right, the vapor from the gasoline, the vapor from, from the diesel, from the kerosene, if it escape, right, and if it must be able to escape, rise upward, mix with all the other the gas atmosphere, upward, outward, and disperse. But if it's stored in a building. It's a different story, right? That's what people just try to do. And people try to do that if you, if you do your business illegally, right? They don't want people, they don't want too much people know that they're selling these and so, so people store them in buildings or in garage, right? So this is what will happen. Then we have radiation. And I think radiation, we all should know about radiation, which is a source of heat from a particular source from one source to empty space to another source, right? Now, so that's radiation. Simple as easy. Right? Now, in your home, as in your, your, your every fire carries what we call a radiated space. Every single fire carries a radiated space. Even to the cigarette that the person is on a light carries a radiated space. More intense the fire, more the, the radiated space. So, as a fire start and start to spread. The radiation space of that fire is going to increase. Not We're looking at these two extinguishers because they are commonly used in Guyana and around the world. This is the infamous what, which which type? Oh, CO2 or carbon dioxide extinguisher. How do you know the CO2 or carbon dioxide extinguisher? The nozzle. By the nozzle, very large here. And this is for a particular purpose because the concentrated CO2 it's an inert gas gas something like dry ice you know all know what happened with dry ice good comes out under high pressure and if it didn't have this big fat nozzle at the end probably would have frozen up in here 
So there is this nozzle here, create expansion and prevent the entrainment of air, air returning into the extinguisher, taking it up. So we have this nozzle here, creates the expansion and prevents the entrainment of air. So the content can flow freely. It is as dry ice, so it can come out, it will come out very cold. And I have seen all sorts of things with this extinguisher. Person use it to cool a nice diet coke and all these things. You know, you put a nice tin juice and just get a cold tin juice and you do your thing. Good, this extinguisher can extinguish. We would mostly recommend it for electrical appliances and so forth. Because if you use, let's say the computer is a little sparking somewhere here. I would use the CO2 because it's, it's a clean agent. It will extinguish the fire and I would still be able to use my computer. Likewise, if I'm doing barbecue and I add too much water or something and there's a hole in the fire on the chicken, I can use that CO2 extinguisher put it out and still eat that chicken. Yeah, it's a clean agent, it's dry ice. It comes out and it just dissipates in the air and there is nothing there, no residue, no nothing. Unlike my good friend here, this is which extinguisher? The dry chemical extinguisher or the ABC. Meaning it can deal with class A fires, paper, wood, and plastic, class B fires, liquid fiber, solids, polish, paint, gasoline, diesel, and class C fires, electrical, of course. Now, in this content, unlike the CO2, there is an inert gas, nitrogen, which will mix with a fine yellow powder. Mono ammonium sulfate. Now, once those two content mix, the content is forced out of the extinguisher and it comes out in a powder form. What it does is create a covering and eliminate oxygen from coming in, thus breaking the triangle of combustion, resulting in the extinction of the fire. How do I recognize and know this type of extinguisher without seeing the rating? Is one, it has a gauge. Two, it has a very fine nozzle. Small? Well, yes, and it's much slimmer than the CO2. Why the, the gauge? Because it has, an, it has a gas, nitrogen. And because of the mechanism, over a period of time, this gas will just soup out. So you can have a full cylinder, but with no expellent gas. If this cylinder don't have the expellent gas, the content will not come out. That is why we recommend regular tests and maintenance once a year. The gauge will indicate two things. That the nitrogen content is up and right once it's a green. That's one. And the other is that the cylinder is filled. I have gone to some institution and applied for five extinguishers. None do not expellent gas. They're heavy, of course. They have the content, but no expellent gas. So once you have one of this type of extinguisher, check your gauge, please, and ensure that it's a green. If it's not a green, recharge. Recharge. How do I operate this extinguisher? Well, these are the basic parts of the extinguisher. A body, or you call it a cylinder. A discharge hose. And at the end of it, there's a horn for the CO2. For the dry chemical, the discharge hose. The bottom would be here, would be referred to as the carrying handle. This would be a carrying handle. This would be an activation lever. And of course, here would be your safety pin. Now the safety pin is there to prevent accidental discharge. So how do I use this extinguisher in the event of an emergency? What do I do? I have, yes, up to me. Pull in and squat, sweep. Oh, sweep. Pull in and sweep. As I was trying to emulate this fancy operation style, pull in and squat. Now, to help us to remember how to use this extinguisher, is simple. Spell the word PASS. Simple acronym, P-A-S-S. -S. So, P is to pull. Pull what? The safety pin. Out. So the first thing I do, 
I pull the safety pin out. There it goes. First step, A. A is the aim. Aim what? Aim the base of the fire. I'm aiming the base with what? The extinguisher like this? Nil. I will aim the nozzle to the base of the fire. And my friends, we all know where the base is. The bottom, the root, the plumb, where the fire starts. So I aim the nozzle to the base of the fire. Next thing? Squeeze. P-A-S. Squeeze what? This lever here, right? The top lever, you gotta squeeze it down. And what else? Sweep from side to side. But it's also important that you maintain a little distance away from the fire. Because based on what is burning, there may be some toxic fumes, there will be heat and so forth. So if the fire is there, you need not to stand up right here. You need to maintain a safety distance about maybe about five, six, seven feet. And another thing is that you should test your extinguisher before you use it. You don't want to go into battle, and when you reach into the fire, then you realize the extinguisher now work. So you need to give it a little test. Uh huh. She's good to go. And then you advance. So you pull the pin, aim the nozzle to the base of the fire, you press, or squeeze, squeeze, and you sweep. It's clean agent, so we have no problem. Unlike this, if I let it out in here, Everybody got to carve their nose and run out because it's dusty.